Hi everyone, it's Mike Bird here. I thought I'd share with you some books that I've been reading recently. Uh, you may want to hear about them. You may want to go out and read them yourselves. Um, first of all, a bit of primary source reading. I've been reading Cyril of Alexandria's On the Unity of the Christ. Uh, in this book, he's particularly attacking a type of Christology called Nestorianism, which, which tends to separate Christ almost into two separate persons, a divine person and a human person. Uh, and in this book, he argues, you know, for the unity, uh, not necessarily collapsing them uh, together, but definitely on the, the, the unity of Christ. And, and some would argue that it's this work that really does tend to influence the Chalcedonian definition. Uh, my, my favorite part of the book uh, is where uh, Cyril says that, you know, what happened is that the word became flesh. It's not like the uh, word was combined with, uh, to quote, some bastard son uh, who was unlucky enough to then end up on the cross. Uh, but it's, it's a good book. Uh, it deals with the question of Christ's impassibility. Uh, in what sense is God impassible? Uh, if Christ suffers and Cyril's answer is that he suffers in his humanity, not in his divinity, or words to that effect. But uh, yeah, a classic work on early Christology, uh, definitely recommended. Uh, in terms of popular culture, I've also been reading uh, Karina Laughlin. Uh, this is called Redeem All, How Digital Life is Changing Evangelical Cultures. And uh, I mean, some of this I already knew about. Um, I learned a bit about how American evangelicals embrace the internet by putting sermons on MP4, having web websites, but uh, the digital space is now obviously a, a big area uh, for ministry and um, you know, everything from marketing and the like. Um, when I was in the, in the army back in the 1990s, in intelligence, we were becoming very aware that cyber was the new frontier you know, cyber warfare, you know, be able to hack into people's computer systems, stop them from being able to use their own uh, computing systems, you know, uh, but that's certainly been accentuated in the last, you know, five or six years, uh, being able to control the internet, the capacity to use it and access it, and also being able to put propaganda on it. Now, again, by analogy, uh, the, the, the cyber area or the digital area is now a very important area of ministry because a, a lot of a lot of a lot of people do church shopping not by visiting the church but by visiting the church's YouTube page, uh, and this is a little bit about how you know evangelicals have embraced the digital culture. Um, yeah, you know, one particular part of the book I really liked um, or I found interesting is the description of popular parochial feminism. For the Christian influencer. And this is where she talks principally about um, Rachel Hollis and also the late um, uh, Rachel Hell Evans and sort of, you know, their influence and, and how they were kind of the epitome of the female Christian influencer. So yeah, this is, this is an interesting book, um, more of a sociological study uh, about how the digital age is changing or shaping uh, evangelicalism, at least as it applies in the United States. For something a bit more theological, uh, I've been reading this one by pra uh, Bradley Nassif, The Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church. Uh, I've always been interested in Orthodox theology, uh, you know, in varying degrees, not to the point that I want to grow a beard, wear a black hat and convert, uh, but I've always been, you know, interested in that tradition. And there are some interesting points of contact between the Orthodox and evangelical tradition. Um, Cyril of Lucaris, or sorry, Cyril Lucaris was an example of a uh, Orthodox patriarch who had a lot of sympathies with the reformed tradition. I always thought he was a very interesting figure, uh, though strangely enough, he was murdered by Catholics from what I learned. But this is a book that tries to explain uh, what are the similarities and what are the differences between the Orthodox and evangelical tradition. And, you know, it talks about some elements of dialogue between the two. Uh, but one aspect of the book I liked, and I think uh, uh, Nassif makes some good observations, is one of the big differences between the Orthodox and Evangelicals is the idea of communal con continuity. So the Orthodox see themselves in organic 
continuity with the body of people and beliefs going all the way back into antiquity, into the ancient past. Evangelicals could not give a flying fajita about that. And evangelicals can be a little bit, let's assume that everyone who came before us were thieves and robbers. And you see that in just both the ignorance of church history, the antipathy to church history, and the assumption that, oh, you know, people back then, they're all, all about worshipping statues of Mary and bowing down to the Pope or the Patriarch, and they're all about their, you know, worship of icons and the like. Um, this book is not designed to turn you into you know, Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox, but it's, it's, it's a good way of understanding that tradition and what that what evangelicals look like from the vantage point of that tradition. So I, I found, you know, Nash's book very helpful in that regard. Uh, one book given to me by one of my colleagues, Andy Judd, which I had a, had a read of, uh, is called Keeping the Faith, which is by Steph Judd. Um, he's an Anglican administrator uh, in Sydney, John Swinton, who's a, uh, who's very much a practical theologian, and Cara, Cara Martin, who's very big on uh, the interface between Christianity and work between Christian life and our more secular life. Uh, it's about how Christian organizations can stay true to the way of Jesus. Uh, if you are running a Christian school, a Christian charity, a Christian startup, or anything that's kind of got like a, a faith-based nonprofit, uh, this is definitely uh, a book. And they, they give all sorts of encouragements and also a whole bunch of warnings, things like beware of you know, donors who want you to tow a particular line, uh, how you handle things like leadership succession. And let me tell you from the organizations I've been in, I think leadership succession is one of the, the biggest and most delicate issues to handle. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're involved in any sort of Christian work or Christian organization, um, and if you want your organization to stay discernibly Christian rather than just become a, you know, vaguely Christian philanthropic, uh, business. This is a, a great way to create a, a, a business culture that will keep you steadfastly Christian. Uh, another one that's just come out uh, by Zachary Wagner, Non-Toxic Masculinity, Recovering Healthy Male Sexuality. In light of recent digital events on a certain website, which I won't name in order to protect the guilty, uh, this might be a good alternative to that kind of a thing. Uh, this is a book I, I not only read, I've even endorsed, and uh, and Zach is very, um, very honest, very open about his own journey, uh, his own struggles, the, the things that he's been through, and what does it mean to be a non-toxic Christian male? You, you would think it's not that hard, uh, but believe it or, or not, he's got a lot of really good advice, a, a lot to say. And just sharing his own story and i think there'll be a number of things that men will read in this and they go oh so i'm not the only one who struggles with that or i'm not the only one who often you know doubts whether i should be saying or doing that type of thing or, or it'll be a kind of maybe a critique of some of the pop patriarchal masculinity that you've been sold so definitely worth checking out uh one from my uh from my brother from another mother uh, Nijay Gupta, uh, Tell Her Story, How Women Led, Taught, and Ministered in the Early Church. This this is a, a good little book. I mean, there's a number of books like this that are around talking about women in the early church, uh, but Nijay is a fantastic exegete. Uh, I think he's doing his best when he's going through the text, exploring the issues and the problems. And he often, oh, I think he always offers um, sensible and coherent answers. Uh, to the questions that were posed. A uh, very good discussion of things like 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15. I want to tell you what he says because, you know, I want you to go and buy the book. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I love I love Nietzsche. He's a great, great guy and anything he puts out is always worth reading. Uh, let me end on something uh, a little bit different. Uh, another primary source text. Probably haven't heard of this one. I can, I can guarantee you probably haven't heard of it. Uh, it's called The uh, Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius. So that's it there, uh, which is a, 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 I think it's a seventh century apocalypse. Now, think of the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, uh, the Christians are the good guys and the Roman Empire are the bad guys. You know, remember that. Christians good, Roman Empire bad. But after the Constantinian Revolution, Christians 
became the Roman Empire. So what do you do with your apocalyptic hopes if you have literally, you know, beaten the bad guys you've become, you know, they have not, not just defeated the, 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 the empire has now become Christian. What kind of apocalypse do you need? Well, in the seventh century, um, someone, probably a, a, a Syriac Christian, most likely, uh, wrote uh, an apocalypse. But in this apocalypse, the Roman Empire are the good guys and the Muslim Arabs are the bad guys. And there's this hope that a Christian king is going to come and win back uh, the East after the Arab conquest of parts of, you know, Syria, Egypt, you know, uh, Cilicia and all those sorts of places. So it's, it's a very, it's a very inter interesting book. And this was a book that had a massive influence on the eschatology and the political ideologies of the Middle Ages, you know, all, all, all the way up into, I mean, up, up into the, to the late Middle Ages, you know, people wanting a Christian king to come and defeat, um, you know, the, the expanding Islamic world that was slowly and steadily gobbling up the Byzantine Empire and, and even threatening um, parts of Spain and Italy and the like. So uh, if you want to understand a little bit of, you know, medieval eschatology, because, um, you know, who doesn't need some medieval eschatology in their lives, uh, this is a book I, I'd recommend. And, I, and I'm even, in fact, I'm hoping to do a special um, YouTube video at some point specifically on the apocalypse of Pseudo Methodius. So that'll be coming to you relatively soon. Uh, but that in a nutshell is all the books I have been uh, reading of late. Um, yeah, check them out yourself if you're so inclined. And... Uh, yeah, enjoy them if you can. Uh, otherwise, take care and I'll see you around either on the Substack page on Twitter or around the channel.